Welcome uh, to the cultural conversations here at DBU. So glad that you all decided to join us. Uh, Krista Powers, uh, Associate Legal Counsel here at DBU. So grateful that you decided to join us around the table this morning. Thank you. Uh, very great. And Tempris Jackson, our Dean of Students. Tempris, so great to have you here. Thank you. And, and Mike Williams, a professor of history. So great to have you here, Mike. Good to be here. Thank uh, you. And we have got an interesting conversation. Two things that apparently you're not supposed to talk about with polite company, uh, which is church and and state as well. And so we're trying to make sense of these midterm <coughs> elections that's going to be happening with us. And what's the Christian contribute to that? And so, Mike, I'm, I'm thinking about the Churchill quote that uh, that says that the, the further we look back into the past, the more clearly we can see into the future. And so as the professor of history, help us to be able to understand uh, historically what have Christians contributed to the political arena? Well, I think, Nick, one of the things that we have to realize is that sometimes Christians aren't comfortable mm -hmm. historically doing mm -hmm. that. Now, there are different reasons why. Uh, sometimes Christians have seen, and this is true in America, even though we typically have had religious liberty and religious freedom, but sometimes Christians have seen government as the oppressor, hmm. the persecutor. Mm -hmm. um, you see that throughout European history or even in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Paul talks about in Romans chapter 13, praying for authorities, he's talking about an oppressive <laughs> yeah, government. Yeah. He's talking about a government that is clamping down mm -hmm. on Christians, and yet he's saying you obey the authorities, you know, until it yeah. conflicts with mm -hmm. your faith, otherwise you pray for the authorities. Mm -hmm. So even that far back, we see that that tension, that mm -hmm. conflict. And, you know, I think the same thing is true throughout history. In the United States, even, there are people that have seen, especially a situation where the church and state are too closely related or tied together, mm -hmm. that not only is the government the oppressor, but an established state church can be the mm -hmm. oppressor as mm -hmm. well. And so that's one of the things, for example, the first dissenters in the colonies had to deal with Roger Williams mm -hmm. and John Clark and people like that. They had to deal with the government and church working together to oppress their faith. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I think we have to look at is that we think, especially in the United States, there's always been this great relationship between the government and the church. Well, it depends on which church you're talking about <laughs> yeah. and what point in government. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other thing I think we need to look at historically is that there's a great deal of diversity mm -hmm. in American history about how Christians relate to the state or mm -hmm. how a particular church or denomination relates to the state. And, you know, again, the, the pat answer is, oh, America's a Christian nation. Well, you know, let's be real careful about yeah. that. Or Christians are always, you know, uh, supportive of the government or Christians stay completely away from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, I have students ask me, well, what, what should Christians do about government or, or what have Christians done or churches done? first thing I ask is, okay, when are we talking about and which Christians are we yeah. talking about? Because there's a lot of diversity there. Oh, well, that brings up a great point. And Tempris, as the dean of students, you really do have a unique vantage point and really do have a, a pulse in the heartbeat of students right now. And so I'm reading all this research out of Harvard, and then there was a Yale study that was just put out that indicated there's a level of apathy among college students right now, and it's indicative towards registration levels. So 90% of individuals are uh, registered for a Facebook account that are or millennial or iGen, whereas it's around 56 to 60 percent that are actually registered to vote. And it's just as easy to register to vote as it is to get a Facebook account. So help us understand, it. is there a level of apathy? Because we also see all these protests that are happening. So give us the student perspective. Yeah, I think one thing that students really struggle with is, is not necessarily being apathetic, but knowing what they would uh, what causes they want to be mm -hmm. interested in. And so I think when you look at social media, you're hit with different, you know, different protests and different yeah. causes. And um, there's so much advocacy that's going on. And I think a lot of students really struggle to find what's important and mm -hmm. what are the things that I, that I actually get behind. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we really try to focus on here, even in student affairs, is... Um, valuing those critical thinking skills mm -hmm. with our students and, and teaching them what is truth? How do you find truth? How do you find what's important? What causes should I get behind? What causes are, um, you know, against my beliefs or against my values and forming those values mm -hmm. and, and really broadening their worldviews. Mm -hmm. And so that is important, I think, in the way our students select causes. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, in some of our protests and some of our movements, there's um, there's really not a concentration on an outcome. There's mm -hmm. just 
there's a lot of excitement around the protest or the actual cause, but there aren't very clear goals. And so I do think that becomes confusing for students. I think that's one of the most salient things. And, and Mike, you could probably speak to this a little later. I was, I'm always intrigued by Martin Luther King because King was so selective of the places that he would protest mm -hmm. because he was working with organizations whereby whenever he would go in and protest, he wanted to make sure there were individuals that were at the seat of power so right. that the protest highlighted the injustice. Right. But then there was avenues by which he could use that power of the protest to be able to affect the change necessary, right. which I just think is very interesting. And Krista, especially from your legal perspective, we're, we're living in a beautiful country, one of the, the greatest country that the world has ever seen. And we have an opportunity, especially as Christians, to be able to love our neighbor by participating in this, this civic engagement known as voting, which is, I think, just a beautiful opportunity, right? Yes, I definitely agree. And I and I love seeing the opportunity in the law to affect justice mm -hmm. just as much in in voting and how you can engage with the system, whether you're a lawyer or not, and to be aware of issues of substantive justice, whether that's um, in areas of immigration or refugee law or whatever it may be and wherever you fall politically might be different, but there are so many opportunities to engage first by asking yourself, how can I be a servant of God? And then how can I be using the gifts that he's mm -hmm. given me to affect justice? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that goes back Mike to what you're saying that there, I mean, I think sometimes uh, in our current environment, everyone wants to say, well, there's a religious right or no, uh, Jesus is a Democrat or no, Jesus is completely out of it. Like uh, uh, it just creates these kind of false dichotomies or just right. these extremes, I guess that are really unhelpful when it comes to the conversation, and especially from a historical perspective, what you were talking about earlier, is it's really important for us to understand that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, we, that we're supposed to be citizens of a different kingdom, but while we're working our way in this kingdom, to be able to be a faithful witness requires us to be able to not be pigeonholed into right. one party or another. Right. Mm -hmm. I always think about it from a perspective, Christians are really bad party people, but they're great issue people, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So. right? Well, and uh, you know, that's very true, Nick. And I, I think one of the things that, that I talk with my students about, and one of the things that I think about frequently is where Christians and government are involved, it's so much, like so many things, there needs to be a dynamic tension. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I brought this on purpose because it's something I take to class sometimes, okay. that, you know, Christians acting in culture and acting, the church asking in relationship to the state, there's a dynamic tension there. Mm -hmm. A rubber band is only as good as you stretch it. Mm -hmm. If you stretch it too far, it snaps. Yeah. If you don't have some tension there, it's worthless, it's useless. <laughs> and I think sometimes that's the way faith and uh, our relationship with our culture, our relationship with government. And, and it's a constant battle, yeah. a constant stretching and contracting you know, mm -hmm. that, that has to take place. And I think sometimes we, we lose the sense that we're all better off by having opposing views. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking someone over here is completely wrong because mm -hmm. they disagree with me, keeping that tension there is really important in a culture, especially in a representative democracy, a, a republic, you've got to have that. And I think especially for Christians, I mean, if we're all about missions and evangelism, then what about social justice? Yeah. Or if we're all about social justice, then what about missions and evangelism? Mm -hmm. And can't we do both? Yeah. And we need both components. And that's one of the things you mentioned, Martin Luther King Jr. and mm -hmm. Tempers was talking about students. If you study the civil rights movements, students were critically important. Oh, yeah. You know, in, in so many different ways. And um, I think that's one of the things that you look back even in, in Christian history. Students are a big part of the Second Great Awakening. Yeah. And especially the missionary impulse that went in that. Again, missions and evangelism, social justice. It, yeah, it reminds me, again, I feel like I'm channeling King so often because King had the famous line of that we aren't servants to the state, we're the conscience of the state. Um, uh, that really the, the church functions as that intermediary institution that really has the opportunity to be able to identify good and to champion it, but also to be the ones that champion and try to restrain evil right. through government purposes right. and uh, means. And so, uh, Tempers, help us to understand from a student perspective, as Mike was talking about, what are some of those issues that you're hearing more more and more students wanting to champion right now, wanting to, especially from a Christian perspective, wanting to champion that cause and be a part of the conscience of the mm -hmm. state. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of one of the most important right now is just religious liberty. Mm -hmm. um, we just hosted a group here on campus, and so that's a very important cause. And also, um, I think 
just looking more into more social causes like mm -hmm. the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. um, and which has been really um, impactful and I think dynamic in a mm -hmm. lot of urban communities. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are some of the biggest. I also think students um, are really getting uh, more into politics, and especially mm -hmm. with our, our race right now that we have going on in Texas, our big oh, Senate race. Yeah. Oh, there's a race um, going on. So I think those are the, the top three that, that really kind of come to mind right now. Uh -huh. But I do think that there is just this tension that Dr. Williams mentioned, especially with our, our pol political race here in Texas of of people being passionate and not necessarily apathetic, but not completely understanding what they're passionate about mm -hmm. and just really kind of struggling to, to align their values with the, right. with the political candidate. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a battle and there's a struggle with our students and understanding, do I forsake my faith or do I side with this person? Because, you know, I want to, I really want to get behind the social cause. Yeah. And so I think there's a, a battle right now that our students are really facing. Mm -hmm. And so, Krista, just from your uh, vantage point, you know, we, that we legally have this opportunity uh, to be able to exercise our right to vote. And so for students that might be listening right now that are either, one, apathetically checked out, maybe two, they're just uh, so disenchanted by fake news, three, perhaps they're like, I uh, just, uh, it's just, and nothing, my vote's not going to change anything. What words of encouragement would you give to them? Yeah, I think I've definitely spoken to students who express exactly what you've said, that they feel like their vote doesn't matter or that they can't affect change. But um, I just pose it back, what change can you affect if you do nothing? Mm -hmm. You already have the answer that you're not going to get any change if you don't take a step forward. Voting is that first step forward. And then beyond voting, there's other advocacy that work that you can do to build upon that. But we have this beautiful system in place where we get to elect our officials. And so if you abstain from that, you're certainly going to achieve nothing. If you engage with that and vote, that's your first step to working towards achieving the changes you want. And then you can add to that with other avenues or opportunities. Yeah, that's so great. It reminds me of, we had Michael Weir on campus, who mm -hmm. is the oh, Obama sure. faith mm -hmm. guy and on his campaign, but also in his, uh, in the White House as well. And he wrote, wrote a book called Reclaiming Hope. And in it, he says that one of the ways to engage, one of the reasons to engage in the political environment is it's a way to be able to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and that being the second greatest mm -hmm. commandment for us is that yes, yes and amen, we should cross the street, we should be hospitable, knowing that we're aliens and strangers in this world, but we also have the unique opportunity to be able to address systemic issues through the political process. And uh, as this election, I believe, is 19 days away from the time that we're taping, no word on when it will actually come out, but it, it's a beautiful opportunity for us to, to glorify our God, but also to be able to do good for our neighbor as well. And so uh, thank you so much, Mike, Tempris, Krista, for joining us. And this has been another Cultural Conversations. We'll see you here next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.